If everyone, uh, if everyone would please stand for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance and the posting of colors. <coughs> Everyone would, you, would bow their heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you today recognizing the strength of your knowledge and skill that you have bestowed upon us. Be with us as we have these, these deliberations. Guide our thoughts and guide our actions that we may work together. As we prepare to, to commemorate the death of Dr. Martin Luther King, May we remember words that he said. He said that darkness is not eliminated by darkness, but by light. Hate is not eliminated by hate, but by love. May that be our guiding principle as we go through our lives. We pray for all those who serve us, whether they're in this country or abroad. Grant them safety and protection. Bless and watch over them and watch over their families here at home. These things we ask in your name, amen. 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 Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, everybody may be seated. Uh, uh, by the way, the uh, uh, colors will po are by Laney High School, Air Force ROTC, Principal Sherrod, uh, Sharon Deschamps, Instructor Colonel Thomas Harrison Smith, and Master Sergeant Bruce C. And the national anthem was from Ashley High School, Principal Patrick McCarty, Instructor Robert Parker. My name's DJ Bowles, and I'm a senior tuba player at Ashley High School. 
I'm Izzy Butler. I'm a percussionist, and I'm a freshman. If our cadets will come down and introduce themselves. I am Cadet Staff Sergeant Bowers. I'm Cadet Staff Sergeant Simmons. I'm Cadet Samantha Woodward. I'm Cadet First Lieutenant White. I'm Cadet in reverse class, Joy Nam. Miss Adams, would you call the roll, please? Here. 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 You have before you the agenda. Uh, I don't know if the superintendent has any additions or deletions. Well, we will go ahead, and uh, I don't think he does. So. Do I hear a motion that we adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. I have a motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It is done. Next item, approval of the minutes. Special meeting minutes, December 20th, 2017, January 2nd, 2018, January 30th, 2018, February 9th, 2018, February 27th, 2018, March 6th, 2018, and March 21st, 2018. Interim meeting minutes, January 9, 2018. Budget Development Committee meeting minutes, March 14, 2018. And regular meeting minutes, February 6, 2018. Do I hear a motion to accept those? I do. A second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? They are approved. Next item on our agenda, recognition of achievement. Um, Ms. Quarterbox, or whoever. Ms. Thomas. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. In Ms. Quarterbaum's absence, I'll be um, doing the recognitions of achievement. Tonight, our community partnership presentation features Live Oak Bank and the support they provide for the Career Readiness Academy at Mosley. Here tonight to tell you more about this great partnership is Principal Adrian Pearson, and from Live Oak Bank, Delia Bell and Kate Grote. Chairman, Vice Chair, members of the board, Dr. Wardley, I just wanna take a moment to say thank you for this opportunity. Uh, the Career Readiness Academy in Mosley has made some tremendous strides over the last few years and a lot of the things that we've been able to do outside of our normal day and budgeting has been with the assistance and help from our great partners at Live Oak Bank. So I want to take a moment to say thank you very much for what you guys have done for us. We look forward to the future and what it has to bring. Thank you. <coughs> well, hi, we're happy to be here. Um, we're excited about um, the partnership that we have with um, CRA at Mosley and um, we look forward again, like you said, to the future and all of the other wonderful things that we're gonna get to do together. So um, we're just gonna go kind of into our presentation and um, tell you a little bit about what we've been doing with them um, since we connected with them in All right, so like I had mentioned, um, our partnership started in 2016. Um, we were um, approached by a Mr. Hutz, I'm sorry, he's still sneaking. Um, and we um, sat down at the school with them and kind of discussed the NAF program 
and um, our partnership was official in 2017. Um, we did issue them our first financial grant this year, um, which that's kind of Kate's role. Um, I work with the closing department, um, and Kate is the director of corporate philanthropy. Um, so I kind of wonder if you want to. So I coordinate volunteers, and I facilitate grant making at the bank. And so I've been helping Dee Dee whenever she needs help, and whenever Mr. Pearson and Ms. Hazel need calls, then I step forward and try to just have all the troops fall in line. Um, so our first um, thing that we did with the school was we um, took a panel of various bank employees um, to the bank um, just to kind of show them all the diverse roles that you can have within a bank and just show that not all bankers are bankers. Um, when you tell a kid that they're going to maybe grow up to be a banker, um, it doesn't sound that exciting. Um, so we really wanted to show them all the different um, things that you can do while working for a financial institution. Um, we took um, our director of corporate health, um, a special assets officer. Um, I went myself, um, a paralegal, an in-house paralegal, and one of our computer program developers. Um, and we just really tried to show them that regardless of what your interest is, you could still find a home in the finance world. Um, and then the next thing we did was um, a panel on the lending process. So this was a more traditional thing. Um, we were asked to do it. Um, it was during the NAF module on financial services. And we showed them the more traditional roles within a bank and talked a lot about what we do and how we do it differently <coughs> from our competitors, um, just to show them that there's options out there. Um, next thing we did, and this was probably my favorite and the most fun, um, was we brought a group of students to the Live Oak campus and hosted a lunch and learn. Um, they toured the campus with us. Um, we got a few people, um, one of our, our on-site restaurant manager, um, a computer coder, and then um, the director of corporate health um, to sit down with small groups and answer questions and really just get them excited about the different things in life um, that you could do within working in a financial institution. Um, probably one of my favorite things happened on this trip at um, we had one student um, who, when he got there, you know, was like, I'm going to be an NFL player when I grow up. And by the time he left, he was like, you know what, I think I might be a computer coder. <laughs> so kind of cool to see um, some, you know, you empower somebody to change their um, goals or, you know, aspirations in life. Um, we did a panel on ethics. Um, this was um, very recently, actually. Um, this was, once again, um, went along with one of the modules they were doing with the NAF program. Um, we really focused on um, ethics in the workplace, um, what it means to be an agent for a business, um, social media, and the decisions that they make now and how those can in impact the rest of their lives. And then um, also focused on giving them some real life examples of the ethical situations that we've seen in our lives. Um, and that it's not always black and white. There can be that gray, and you have to be real careful in the decisions you make. Um, I go to um, the advisory board meetings as the liaison for Live Oak Bank, um, and I try to be as active um, and um, of a member as I can be. Um, I do go and grade the cumulative projects um, as often as I can. Um, as this is one of those um, presentations, actually. Um, so. Um, I really enjoy that. I think that's the piece that I like the most about being on the advisory board is going and getting to give positive and um, impactful feedback to the kids on these modules that they're doing. So that's um, a lot of what we've done with CRA. Um, we do have a few other things that we do within the community for the um, school system. Just a quick touch on those. We do junior achievement. Um, we've done it with Sunset Park and Alderman. Um, we provide tutors to GLOW. Um, we have volunteers reading um, at Forest Hills, and we're hoping to add Alderman. And then we posted a Lunch and Learn through the VRC type grade group. There we go. Thank you. Um, and that's it. That's what I've got. So, thank you. You're, you're also, I uh, have a presence on, with the Blue Ribbon Commission. That we do. And um, I know that uh, you all have the big picture. I, I guess my question for you would be, 
um, from the time you begin uh, with the students to the time you wrap up, um, who learns the most? Do, you, do they learn more from you or do you learn more from them? in their interactions. Um, but I like to think that they get a little bit of something from us. I'm occasionally. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, if nothing else, we gave them some really good food. <laughs> now what I meant by the comment was most uh, folks that I see that work with young people and try to expose them to the world and the possibilities, they find that they learn a lot from them in terms of their perspective and then how you can approach them to be more successful each time you meet. So anyway, I thank you a lot for what you did. Thank you. And we appreciate the uh, partnership and the opportunities. Principal so. Pearson, what, what made you reach out to Live Oak in the first place? Like why, <coughs> why them? It was uh, several layers involved there. Um, first of all, they're doing some very good things. It's probably one of the most progressive campuses in our community. Um, and then also meeting out and all the time Good pick. Well, thank you for all that you do for our school system. Yeah. Yeah. We do appreciate it. Thank you. The county commissioners and board of education have made an investment in our future educators. We'd like to um, acknowledge that Mr. Rob Zappel, county commissioner, is here this evening. This scholarship is for 7,000 each year to an accredited North Carolina college or university of the recipient's choice for a total amount of $28,000 per scholarship. The scholarship for recipients make a commitment to teach at least four years in New Hanover County Schools, helping build our pool of highly qualified teachers. We appreciate the principals from the schools that these future teachers come from. They are Mrs. Descharm, Laney High School, if you could stand. <laughs> Dr. Steve Sullivan, Hoggard High School. Ms. Mary Paul Bell, Isaac Bear Early College. We also appreciate Mrs. Dolores Overby, principal of Riceboro Elementary School, who allows Laney cadets to teach at her school, and Laney teacher cadet coordinator, Ms. Rochelle Dombrowski. At this time, <laughs> at this time, I'll int introduce this year's scholarship recipients and ask you to please remain standing for a group picture. From Laney High School, Phoebe Roberts. Also from Laney, Ramiro Santiago Lopez. <laughs> from Hoggard High School, Tatiana Athman. <laughs> and from I. And from Isaac Bear Early College, Tyler Gibson. <laughs> yes, if their parents are here, we ask that you please come to be recognized. Board members as well. Yeah, let's do it.
Congratulations, and we look forward to welcoming you as teachers in just a few years. let the audience know that our first class will graduate this year and return to us as teachers this fall. So we look forward to uh, placing them in our schools. Next, we applaud students across the district for awards earned in the state PTA Reflections Contest, an arts recognition program that encourages students to explore their talents and express themselves while enhancing quality arts education. When I call your name, please come forward and remain standing for a group picture. From Myrtle Grove Middle School, Linda Yap, who won the Special Artist Award for Outstanding Interpretation. In the category of dance choreography, Ellie Badrock of Parsley Elementary, Kylie Cantor from Parsley Elementary, Validy Kamek from Myrtle Grove Middle School. In film production, we congratulate Maya Roseboro from Anderson Elementary. and Jake Barrow from Parsley Elementary. In literature, Pittman McEwen from Ogden Elementary. In music composition, Scott McFarlane from Parsley Elementary. <laughs> Benjamin Davis from Laney High School. And finally, in photography, we congratulate Katie Edge from Parsley Elementary. <laughs> and from Holly Shelter Middle School, Trista Guidi. Our first place winners will now compete in the National PTA Contest. When I call your name, 
please step forward. Ellie Badrick, Valerie Kamick, Maya Roseboro, and Benjamin Davis. We wish you the best of luck at the next level. And our last award, finally, we'd like to recognize Alec Sampson of Hoggart High School. Alec is a wrestler who went undefeated this year and recently earned the 4A State Wrestling Championship in the 160-pound weight class for Hoggart High School. I would like to invite Alec to please come. If Alec's parents are here, could you please stand to be recognized? Also, if a wrestling coach, Thomas Pierce, athletic director, director Christy Tennis Brown, and Dr. Sullivan, if you are here, please stand also. Congratulations, Alec, on your hard work. This concludes our recognitions for the evening. The uh, next item on our agenda is the call to the audience. We have had no one to <coughs> sign up, so we'll move on from there. Next item, Head Start report, Head Start liaison, Mr. Shell. As you can see on your agenda, you have um, three items. The uh, first is the liaison report, which you're familiar with. Um, just for the audience's sake, Head Start is a federally funded program. You head over uh, county schools took over some time ago and has done an excellent job with. There are 263 and four-year-old children that are served in this program. It's federally funded, and because of that, uh, this board serves as a fiduciary in a fiduciary capacity. So for transparency, uh, each month we come forward and we talk about um, uh, the, the program, and we're, we have experts here that we can ask questions of. I am in front of you is the liaison report, which uh, as much of the demographics, but uh, some of the updates are uh, teachers uh, for the, for the uh, benefit of the audience. Teachers met with families at their homes to discuss children's progress, upcoming kindergarten registration, and update progress on goals for those families. So I think that's awesome that they reach out in that capacity to be more successful. Johnson Pre-K held its annual kindergarten transition night where representatives from 14 schools shared information on their programs and kindergarten readiness. These included district schools, year-round, magnet, lottery, and the UNCW lab school, which is about to begin at the uh, Virgo site. North Carolina Head Start Association 49th Annual Conference was attended by two of our teachers and a family specialist. So again, they're constantly working to have the latest and greatest to do the best job. Uh, there are some other items there. I think that's the, uh, 
the major highlights for tonight. Um, I have experts with me. Are there any questions about that report? <clears throat> okay, second item is your monthly expenditure report. And again, for the benefit of the audience, it's a $1.97 million federal grant and the school system uh, provides indirect support such as uh, where the program is housed and utilities and IT or information technology and, uh, and other uh, areas of support. It is a grant that runs through April. So we are, for purposes of tonight, 10 months into our 12 month program. 10 months would be about 84% of the year. And as you can see, um, from a bottom line standpoint, we have spent a little less than that, 79% in total um, on the program. Any uh, questions about that? The um, indirect costs, what, are, what, is, what, is, what is that made up of? Indirect cost is the, uh, how the school system backs up and supports the program, not direct dollars, but such things as uh, the building, the maintenance, the utility cost, so like uh, the uh, IT backup, that kind of thing. Did you just explain it? I'm sorry. Ma'am? I said, did you just explain that? I'm sorry. That's okay. I got distracted. The it, grant requires that we as a grantor provide a certain amount of indirect cost. And so that's, that's how we do that. And the, the third item um, uh, on the agenda for Head Start, the last item, is very exciting. And I'm going to turn that over to Ms. Smiles to make an introduction that we're very, very proud of. Thank you, Mr. Shell. Let me introduce to you the FIRST Advocates Project program. The FIRST Advocates Project is an 18-month parent training program conducted by the National Head Start Association in conjunction with early education programs in North Carolina and Florida with the support of PNC Grow Up Great. In this project, only five parents get selected from the state of North Carolina to represent in this project. Only five. If selected, they will learn about specific pieces of state legislative related to early childhood education, how to powerfully tell a story as a parent, how to engage lawmakers, how to build relationships and collaborate with others in the state to improve access and the quality of early learning. They will participate in a series of in-depth leadership and educational trainings. This curriculum includes, but is not limited to, effective speaking, building relationships, networking, messaging the importance of high quality early education. In addition, they will have the privilege of visiting the state capitol and applying their learned skills by sharing their story. We are so very proud tonight to share with you Ms. Brittany Kermati, who has been selected to participate in 2018 First Advocate Project. Brittany has three beautiful children whom all attended Dorothy B. Johnson Pre-K Center Head Start. She is a working parent that is very dedicated to the education of her children. Congratulations. Mrs. Cromarty. Good evening. It's an honor to receive this award. Um, as I was talking to Ms. Shannon, I was offered this position after doing a long application. Um, at first, I didn't want to do it. It was Something challenging, um, takes a lot of dedication. We'll be traveling to Florida and Washington for trainings. Um, but I stepped aboard and that's something that I'm looking forward to doing. Also, we just got confirmation that we will be beginning the training starting in mid-May, the end of May. 
Um, the first training will be held in Raleigh, so it's not too far. But um, I've had the honor to serve with the Policy Council for four years as my children get through Head Start. Um, as of right now, I'm just looking forward to representing New Hanover County on this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Miles, Ms. Miles, I have a question. Yes, sir. I, correct me if I'm wrong. We have been awarded a five-year extension on our Head Start program without having to bid for it. Is that correct? Um, Non-competitive? Non-competitive. So what we did in four years of executive years of operation, we have not had any finding with our federal government program with Head Start. Um, therefore, at this point in time, nobody can bid against it. Um, they cannot bid to take over those services. New Hanover County Schools is granted. I, I just wanted to make that aware to indicate <laughs> what a quality program you and your staff have been running mm -hmm. at Head Start and how good it has been for New Hanover County. Thank you very much. And we couldn't do that with our direct services at Johnson in the support of the Board of Education. We appreciate you very much. Thank okay. you. Next item on our agenda is under information, empowering youth engaging schools, eyes, grant, appendix D, Dr. Holliday. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Good to see you all tonight. I have good news. We have received uh, a grant from the National School Climate Center. <coughs> And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to introduce some <coughs> guests from New York City tonight to come and talk to us about this grant. Five New Hanover County middle schools recently were selected for the EYES grant from the National School Climate Center. The Empowering Youth Engaging Schools grant is a three-year initiative that combines a comprehensive approach to school climate improvement with an instructional approach to build cultural competency and reduce bullying behaviors. The five participating middle schools are Murray, Myrtle Grove, Williston, Trask, and Holly Shelter. Tonight, I'm proud to have with us a couple of folks that, uh, from, the, from the center, and I'm gonna introduce them in just a moment, but I'd like to provide recognition for a couple of members of my team who worked really hard on this. Uh, Kristen Jackson, Kristen, come up. You just sit up here with me. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Judy Stubblefield, who um, is our, as most of you hear about all the travelings that she does throughout the county all year, I'm going to ask them just to come up and um, any questions you might have. But right now, I'd like to introduce our guests who are going to provide a brief overview of this program uh, from the National School Climate Center in, yes, that's right, New York City. <laughs> Whitney Allgood, who is the CEO, and Serena LaRock, who is the Director of Education. A few ladies would come up. As they're coming, I'd like to recognize one more person back there. We actually learned about this grant because we were doing a presentation with uh, Jay Corpening, or Judge Corpening, in Charlotte. And so, uh, Judge, thank you for the invitation to that event because it helped us lead us here. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for welcoming um, us into, I'm gonna be speaking, Whitney is behind me as some moral support. Um, I'm gonna make this a little bit interactive if that's okay, if you could be vulnerable with me for a moment. I promise it's only a little bit of vulnerability because vulnerability is earned, so. Um, how many of you have experienced bullying, um, whether personally or indirectly with someone you know, or have seen bullying? Just raise your hand. Okay, so I think that I wanted to start there because um, this is not uncommon at all. So I'm gonna give you some statistics before I go into the program. Um, nearly one in, five, uh, one in four U.S. students have been uh, victims of bullying behaviors. Uh, the second thing is 70% of students have witnessed bullying. Only four in 100 adults will intervene. 
Victims of bullying are more likely to miss school, be suspended, be incarcerated, drop out of school, and experiencing learning problems. So I just wanted to start there because there is a need, right? It's always important to think about the why. So um, we have a uh, school climate survey that we've been gathering data for about 10 years, and one of the domains in our survey does focus on safety. And over the 10 years of data that we collected, we find that uh, students report feeling less socially and physically safe than adults realize, right? And so that's an, an important thing to just pause on because if we're thinking about um, this initiative, we really engage the youth in doing this, and that's exactly for that re reason. So what is EYES? Miss, quick mission statement. Um, it seeks to engage and empower youth and community to create safer schools by building cultural competency to reduce bullying behaviors. I'm gonna say what that means. I know I just threw a bunch of things at you, but I just wanted to say what that mi mission statement is. So, this is a fully funded initiative. It's about 1.5 million resources to this community um, for a number of reasons. We'll t I'm gonna talk about what that money would um, be spent on and what it entails. Um, but it is a multi-year initiative, so that's why we came here to New York City, because we know relationships matter and you're stuck with us for three years. So that's what I wanted to start off with. Um, it engages and empowers staff, students, and communities to um, create safer schools by recognizing and reducing bullying behaviors. And it combines a comprehensive school climate improvement so our National School Climate Center, it's that piece, what is school climate? So we're looking at norms, values, we're looking at organizational structures, we're looking at teaching and learning, just really the whole school as an entity. And also, because the classroom matters, it, we um, partnered with Facing History and Ourselves that has that instructional approach. So they're gonna work with the teachers to talk about curriculum, they're gonna work with them to talk about pedagogy, to have some student-centered um, approach. How do you handle this situation? How do you discuss this particular curriculum? So it's both from the classroom, but then thinking about leadership down. It's that top-down, bottom-up approach. And through this, um, the school leaders will gain skills and capacity to sustain and deepen these changes over time. So we don't wanna just be with you for three years and leave, and there's no evidence of what we've done, right? So we wanna build and sustain those efforts. So, um, Let's talk about our impact a little bit. So you're not the first group that we're trying this on. Um, we did pilot this in um, Illinois. Uh, we worked with uh, Prevent School Violence Illinois. We like, we, at that point, we worked with a more local organization. And it was a three-year anti-bullying initiative. And through that, we saw up to 40% reduction in bullying behaviors. So we had five schools, and they ranged from um, suburban to urban. There were no rural schools, I'll be honest, um, but that's, that's the, the group that we worked with. And so we did see results. A little bit about, um, so I, I kind of laid out the what and the why. So like, who are we, right? Um, I'm representing the National School Climate Center, and we've been around for over 20 years. We've worked with um, international ministries. We've worked with um, state um, uh, Department of Education. So currently I'm managing um, a, a partnership with uh, Pennsylvania as they're doing uh, implementing school-wide. But we've also worked with districts and directly with schools. So we've worked on different levels. Um, our partners, Facing History and Ourselves, they started off as teachers, a group of teachers that got passionate and somehow made this thing happen and they've been working around for 50 years. Um, so that's a little bit about who we are. So, now how do we do it? Um, with our uh, school climate improvement approach, we work on all levels. So I don't know, I don't know if you can see, you guys have things up on your monitor? Perfect, <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> so uh, I find that that diagram that we have or that figure that we have is really important. So we have students at the center, um, but we're working across all levels because honestly, they're not working in silos and we all have to be in this together and do it together. So um, I'm gonna start with the districts. How do we help? How does the EYES initiative help the district? Um, so we, we do provide some planning and implementation curricular supports. So they've reached out to Travis and Stephanie so far and they've scheduled some time to work with them. 
Um, we, ah, my earring came out, sorry guys, um, plan to, uh, with districts to strengthen a network across five participating schools. So the great thing about this is the schools are already a community, we're just gonna strengthen it, right? You're starting from a really good place. Um, in terms of the school, we're going to build skills, knowledge, and capacity of the school leadership. So we're working closely through intensive coaching with the principal, and they can select one other person who would get certified. Um, and we're gonna work with them. Things happen, right? How do you handle doing a pretty comprehensive initiative when something happens, an unfortunate event of a school suicide or something like turnover, right? Like there's all these different things that are unexpected. We can only plan so much. So we help with that coaching to do that. Another thing that we help with is that this is not another flavor of the month, right? So this is not just another initiative. So how can we look at everything that you're doing well, whether it be PBIS or you know something about highly effective teachers, thinking about all those different initiatives that you have going on within the community and how can we enhance it through our work, right? So that's, that's a, a bit that we do there. Um, we have some robust um, metrics, so a good thing is if you're going to be strategic, you need to start off with what do you have, right? And it's not e anecdotal, um, evidence is important, but what other types of data sets do you have? So I know that um, New Hanover County is using ABE, so that's one data set. Another data set could be some school climate data sets that we do offer for free um, as part of this initiative. So there are different things that we think about um, what measurements can we collect? We pay for that um, within limitations, right? So we have tools that we pay for. Um, and then we help them look at the data and plan strategically, um, thinking about benchmarks and things of that sort. Another thing is uh, we provide guidance on restorative justice practices. So why do we do that? This is a bullying initiative. A lot of times when you have bullying um, and the teachers or adults are unintentionally um, uh, reinforcing bullying, it tends to be that it's a classroom management issue or just a behavior management issue, right? Um, there are a whole other reasons that I can go to, but that is one of the main reasons. So if we're gonna address bullying, we need to provide some strategies, and so that's where we have the restorative justice practices. The next one, um, we have is looking at the students. This one, classroom, so skip that one. Um, and so this one, I, I, I briefly made mention to it, but I'm gonna go a little bit more in detail on how we do that. So we provide um, pedagogic strategy to create a positive classroom climate that supports um, learning and student development. Again, we reinforce teaching restorative discipline strategies to, to promote kindness and um, teach, uh, and, and that supports classroom management. The other thing is um, we help teachers and also admin uh, reflect on how they can institutionalize respect for diversity. Now I'm not only talking about diversity in terms of race, we expand that, right? Ability, other things of that sort, right? And so that's, that's what we're talking about there. And also because achievement matters, it is a vigorous and rich um, content that's aligned with standards. Specifically, um, in this particular curriculum, we're working with uh, social studies and ELA. Uh, so it is, it is aligned, uh, we, don't, we understand the importance of um, students achieving, so that's another thing that we do there. Students, now. Um, so we support youth to become leaders in the school climate improvement process. One concrete example that um, we did with uh, the schools in Illinois, they came and they presented to the school board. This is what's happening to my school. This is what's going on. Here are some suggestions that we have. So that's just one concrete example. There's a whole range of things that the students did. Um, and they were middle school students that did um, really help them to become leaders. The other thing is that we strengthen youth adult partnerships. So. Another uh, major fact in terms of bullying, and so just kind of bringing it back to why we do that, is that relationships are incredibly important. So a student can be bullied, but if they feel supported, it, it almost, um, I don't wanna say it does away with the bullying itself, but it helps a lot if they have that relationship. So we're looking at relationships with adults, do they feel cared for, and also relationships with their peers as well. Um, the other thing uh, is that we encourage student voice. So going back to the student-centered classroom, the, the types of questions we ask, they, they promote critical thinking. 
Um, and also, when we're thinking about uh, developing certain strategies, asking the students what they want. Now, we understand that they have a voice, right, and so that the adults are helping to facilitate that, but just really getting their feedback there. And then the final thing for the students is um, we really believe that there, there's power in community bonds, and so we help with some youth-led engagement efforts. For the community, the larger community, um, we do provide tools and professional development to strengthen the school family and school community partnerships. Now that's gonna vary by school and so that's why it's a little bit less there, um, but that's another piece that we do. I mentioned before what makes this uh, different than other bullying prevention initiatives. And so again, I just wanted to emphasize that it really capitalizes on what the school does well. What are their strengths? How can we enhance their strengths? How can we identify certain gaps to even enhance that strength more? Um, we support schools in um, integrating uh, different initiatives, as I mentioned, so that you're thinking, you're using your time effectively, you're um, uh, bringing your resources to one particular place. A lot of times, there's, in, in our experience, there are schools that do multiple initiatives and they're like five different teams and one person can be across five teams and they're tapped, right? And so just thinking about all those different pieces there. The next thing that helps is that we build capacity across the school. So we're supporting the um, school leadership, we're supporting instructional leads, we're working with professional development so that we can impact the entire staff. And then also we're providing um, instructional training books and materials as well. Now, a big piece to this is that formative evaluation drives action planning. And so that's where they're gonna get access to the school climate um, data, bullying behavior assessments data. Um, they're gonna have support in interpreting those findings. So a lot of times we can have all the data in the world, but we don't always know how to read them collectively, right? Or sometimes it's just a lot to read collectively. So we do help with that. And then we, um, we provide that guidance from, now you have this data telling the whole story, connecting bullying data, discipline data, connecting school climate data. What do you do next? Then the next uh, piece is that we emphasize collaboration across school communities. So I mentioned this, right? So um, in here, the student leadership opportunities is part of the Youth Summit. That's an event that's part of this initiative. Uh, and I, I spoke about this, so I'm gonna skip this slide a little bit. So all of that to say thank you, and finally, we pay for the resources, right? So there's all these great things, but there's realities of subs, there's realities of having to pay for professional development, and so this 1.5 million does pay for all of that. Um, there is limitations, of course, it is 1.5 million, it's not 100 million, but, um, <laughs> but, the, but we do think about that. We just wanna make um, this as easy as possible because we know that money is real, time is real, and so there it is. Thank you so much. question I think um, I mean I think it, it sounds great I, I love the fact that um, you know I appreciate everyone that worked on on the grant I appreciate all being here uh, I think one of the, the the biggest things that you have to have from the school end is obviously buy-in mm -hmm. so how, how do you how do you get that when you walk in and you say I've got this great program you know we're gonna we've got all the bells and whistles we've got all these great great tools how do you get the, the folks at the school and to, to use those tools? That is a great question. I'll answer that for you. Um, so a number of ways. Okay. <laughs> so we actually spent some time, there was an application process. And so the first thing that we wanted to see was that there was district buy-in. And we spent time with Kristen. Um, I've presented to them. We've asked questions. We've applied. Then we had individual calls with the school leaders and Ron from uh, Williston, sorry not to put you on the spot, but he can attest to that. And so, is this great for your school? Um, and they individually had to buy in. I'm here for buy in as well, right? So, um, commitment to coming to speak to you all because you're part of the community as well. So, that's another piece. We're actually spending between now and um, August for different stakeholders. We're buying, it, it's like a whole 
process of buying it. But not only that, we just need to learn about the culture of New Hanover County. We need to learn about what data sets you're already collecting, what you're already doing. So this, that's that whole piece there. Then in the fall of 2018, that's when we start to then expand out. So there is a big emphasis on buy-in because you are absolutely right, it's important. So all the schools that, that have this grant, they've already said, yep, we're on board, we're gonna do this thing and-, and Indeed. You know, I personally awesome. sat and spoke to them. <laughs> so yes. Wonderful mm -hmm. news. All right. Thank you. You're very welcome. I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> so this program is funded by the Harvey Miller Foundation. Mm -hmm. And how are they funded? How are they funded? Is they're just reaching they're, they're out. They're just rich. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a three-year program. <laughs> as, as Ms. Estep said, you, you get the buy-in and you, you go to change the world, right? Uh -huh. So one question I did have, you were talking about how um, um, I think the numbers were 70% experienced, but only one in four are willing to step up. After you've done your program, uh, how does that one in four change? Have you done work on that? We do. So a big piece in this is that we talk about um, a, what we call upstander behavior, and there are different ways to step up, right? So stepping up doesn't always mean interfering immediately and say stop, right? Because there, there could be some potential issues there. Um, but yes, that is something that we address. How could both students and also adults step up? Mm -hmm. Last question. Yes. Um, why did you choose New Hanover County Schools? For the beach. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, honestly, I, I will say this. Um, I co-presented with Judy, um, and I was really impressed with um, how we worked well together. And then I met everyone else on the New Hanover team, Judge Corpenin, I mean, t sorry, Dr. Markley. <laughs> Um, and I just thought that it was such a pretty impressive group. Then I was introduced to Kristen, and she was incredibly responsive. The questions that were asked, we spoke with LaShawn um, as well. And so I'm, I apologize for doing the first name basis. Um, but, you know, it just, I was incredibly impressed by the thoughtful questions that were asked, things that were going on in the community, the level of responsiveness, and just relationships. So that's why. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? No. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Next item on our agenda, Career Readiness Academy at Mosley Performance Learning Center. Dr. Smith. This is a follow-up from our last meeting when we did our specialty programs. And you asked for some more information about Career Readiness Academy. Dr. Smith has had a family medical... Uh, oh situation and so Dr. Holliday will uh, do the introduction. Notice she didn't say anything about how impressive the deputy superintendent was. That's by design. I'm just kind of <laughs> underneath everything. <coughs> we do appreciate all the work and Judge, before you get out of here, thank you. I didn't mean to leave you out. Um, <clears throat> we also have a very exciting program to talk about tonight and uh, that is, of course, uh, all the programs that we have at Mosley. Mosley is probably our most diverse and, um, I want to say, flexible program. We have lots of things going on over in that Mosley building. Um, we've got a good man in charge over there, um, uh, Mr. Pearson. He's very happy right now because all of his teams from Philadelphia are winning championships. <laughs> um, if you go into his office, he's got everything mm. Philadelphia. And I'm really not sure why, but he's all about Philadelphia. And so, um, but at any rate, Mosley is, has lots of things going on from the, from the Performance Learning Center and all the things that they're doing uh, to the uh, TPYA program which in my opinion is one of, is, is one of the, the, sh the shining achievements of the New Hanover County Schools. Those young folks um, with special needs going out into the world and doing things that, that a lot of folks don't think kids like that ought to be able to do, but they can and they're very successful. That's an exciting program. And then this year, um, pre-K. So basically from birth to graduating from high school, we've got stuff going on over there at Mosley. So it's an exciting program. So I'm going to ask 
um, Mr. Pearson to come up and speak on his program. Good evening again. Um, I brought with me this evening uh, Ms. Brooke Hazelwood, who is our academy director and our instructional coach. Um, and we are very excited to share with you a little bit about the vast and broad umbrella we've developed at the Curtis Academy. Uh, we have been in a position now to where we've sat down and talked with Dr. Markley, uh, Dr. Holliday, um, members of the board as well, to try and give it a new hook um, as far as the Career Readiness Academy has gone from the traditional performance learning center. With that being said, we're now in our fourth year of our complete program, and we'd like to say that we offer it an unparalleled environment for our New Harry County students. Why do we sound parallel? We have four programs. We have 150 plus students. We range in ages, as Dr. Holliday stated, from age three to 22 years old. We'll take a few minutes even to highlight each program. And as you all know, and most of you have seen, our doors are always open. Come visit, let us show off a little bit, let our students show off. And we look forward to what they have to tell you and you can see there as well. Um, we are a NAF Academy, as you heard earlier from our partners, Lava Bank. Um, NAF is a national nonprofit. Uh, we are very fortunate to have been awarded as a certified Academy of Finance this year. Um, NAF is a model in which they try and bring and bridge the business community, our community leaders, the leaders of tomorrow, and give them that non traditional and change the traditional high school experience just a little bit. I'll turn it over to Ms. Hazelwood, let her say a few things for you, and I'll come back and wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us tonight. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk about our program that we're so proud of. Um, we also are really thankful for the students and the families that have made that possible. Uh, we have a very diverse, engaged student body. Uh, they are, they come to us because they are searching excuse me, searching for a non-traditional experience. So what we offer them is project-based learning, uh, collaborative work, uh, interdisciplinary instruction. Uh, we also are a wall-to-wall -wall stay school, and so we find that there is a lot of value added um, from having the stay program in our building. And of course, NAF, the National Academy Foundation. So uh, the things that make us different, uh, So um, really there are a few things that really set us apart um, and these are the things that we try to highlight just because there are several non-traditional programs and so sometimes people are wondering you know about the nuance you know what really sets you apart what makes you different and uh, the big reason that students come to us and the thing that makes us so different is that we really are a small setting and so we can offer personalization to students. Uh, Students come to us because they really want more one-on-one -on -one attention. They really want to have a relationship with their teachers. Uh, and they want a smaller setting so that they can concentrate. All of our students are really dedicated scholars that want to be successful. And they're coming to us for guidance uh, so that they can move on into the world of work with some high school experiences that prepare them for that opportunity as well as for a college experience if that's what they're looking for. So their experience at our school is very tailored and personalized. Uh, of course, with the National Academy Foundation, uh, we are an academy of finance. Um, we don't necessarily view that as our students are all coming to be accountants. You know, they, there are students who are gonna go that direction. We really see our academy of finance as uh, fostering financial literacy for students and building a really strong foundation uh, for students who are, are going out into the world. Uh, NAF track certification does offer students preferential hiring, and so students do have to take a series of courses that are NAF courses. Uh, in order to do that, they have to pass, um, as uh, Dee Dee Bell mentioned earlier, uh, a, cumul a cumulative project, which is a panel presentation in front of a board of judges. Uh, similar to like a graduation project, but it's after each nine week course that is a NAF class. Uh, and they also have to pass a, an EOC, it's a, a NAF uh, test that students take for each of the four courses. 
Um, our students just took their NAF test today for principles of finance, and uh, 10 of the 11 students passed the course. Um, they also, all 11 students were successful in their panel presentation, so they are on their way to NAF track certification. And what that offers them is preferential hiring at businesses that are partnered with NAF, uh, as well as uh, other opportunities such as work-based learning, uh, so that they really have a very solid foundation that they know what they want to do when they graduate from high school and they've had those experiences. Uh, job shadowing, internships, career college promise courses, those are all built into the NAF model. Uh, so those off-site learning opportunities, uh, we don't see them just as field trips, we see them as opportunities for our students to really engage in the community um, and build capacity so that they are uh, learning a lot from those experiences and taking away and reflecting on those experiences as well. So another thing that stands out um, in a way that we are different is that we ha offer five classes per semester, so our students are front-loading their courses. All students take the stay or advisory course, um, so our students have the potential for 11 credits each year. And that, what that does is that gives them space in their schedule in their junior and senior year to uh, then go out and do the Career College Promise classes, which we think are really beneficial for students as well as to do the internship, which NAF, according to NAF, is a paid internship. Yes, ma'am. What happens with the 11th student who didn't pass today? She will have the opportunity to retake the test. And so then she will retake that, that test. If she isn't successful, she will continue in NAF track um, and continue to take NAF courses because there's other courses in the NAF continuum that allow her to get NAF track certified. So there are CCP courses that also count. So we will keep her in the NAF track as long as she's interested in doing so. And if not, then she just graduates from high school with, as a NAF alumni um, who had the opportunity to participate in the NAF program. But you know, maybe it, it's not for everyone, but it's a great opportunity for all students. Thank you. Sure. Um, this is a photo of our math team. We have a really engaged math team. Um, they participate in regional competitions. They've been very successful. Um, they have developed a love of math they might not have had had they not come to an academy of finance. Um, and so a lot of the students are sort of developing this love of finance and math because we are hoping to sort of show them what's available. A lot of students don't necessarily know what they're interested in because they haven't been exposed. So that's a big part of what we do at our school is offer them exposure to the community and to the world of work. Um, we have about 80 students now um, currently enrolled in our NAF Academy. We are fully engaged in recruitment efforts right now. Um, we've done 35 interviews in the last two weeks and so letters will go out um, and we'll continue interviewing as long as we're getting uh, applications. Um, and so we're, we're working on that process right now. Um, in 2016-17, we were a NAF member academy. Um, and this year in 2017-18, we've become a certified academy. Um, so we are growing as far as the academy assessment and um, the assessment pieces that we are meant to uphold according to NAF which are things like project-based learning, um, exposure to work-based learning, opportunities for students, guest speakers, um, all of those things that are built into the program. So we are really giving students a very rich experience. Um, we are working very hard to prepare them to make informed decisions about their future and to show them what that looks like by leading by example. Um, and really building their awareness of careers as well as helping them to explore and then prepare through mock interviews and then the experience of the internship, which hopefully will be paid. And that is thanks to some of our community partners as well as the advisory board. Um, that is sort of the intent of the advisory board is to help us provide internships for our students as well as to help us fund uh, the internships, the paid internship opportunity for students. So we really are proud of the program. We have great students. Um, we, we just grow and get better every year and so we're really excited about what we have to offer. Do you all have any questions for me about the Career Readiness Academy? 
Who are some of your um, community partners? Like, what, um, do you have some internships already in place? We don't because we are so new. Um, we only have currently sophomores that are in the cohort. So we don't have students that have gone on to internships, but some of our community partners, we have um, obviously Live Oak Bank, um, Alliance Credit Union, uh, we have Tilia Partners, uh, we have um, Castle Branch that we work with very closely, and then all of the members are of our advisory board that represent um, different organizations, Merrill Lynch, um, a lot of financial institutions, um, and then a retired uh, NAF principal from New Jersey who has been really uh, important in our work. And so um, that's been really strong and helpful to us. But we're trying to grow our board. That's one of our goals. Um, it's in our action plan it's just to reach out to the community and um, get more people on board with offering those um, opportunities for students and also coming in and engaging with our students regularly. Any other questions? Sounds exciting. Thank you. We, we are very excited and we appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about it. The students love Mosley. Anytime we go to graduation, they have so much pride and so th they absolutely love the instructors and love the school. And that's a testament to you. It's true. Our students love being at our school. They choose to come there. Um, and so they really are happy um, it's a very positive atmosphere. Um, it's very peaceful, and um, it's just a really nice place to work and teach. And so we're really lucky we have this gym in our county. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So you see, the Academy of Finance through our Career Academy has been something that has opened a lot of eyes. Uh, the the fact that our students can go to these work-based learning opportunities um, and see that because we may be in NAF Academy of Finance, there's more to it than just standing at a bank in a line as a teller giving out money. I mean, they got to meet um, weight instructors, health and wellness instructors. They got to meet people who work behind the scenes. Earlier we talked about Dee Dee, um, Ms. Bell who does the loans and things like that. All things behind the scenes that may open a few eyes to our students that they don't see regularly besides going through the line or going to ATM. So that's been a very positive piece there. Um, Ms. Hazelwood has been instrumental in a lot of the work with our middle schools and our counselors, trying to get the students more interested in what we're doing in our school and coming, because as you know, our district offers a lot of quality education for our students. So we have to continue to make sure we show them that um, we are up there and up to speed as well. Uh, moving on. As Dr. Holly touched on earlier, our transition program for young adults, TPYA. This year, the 20th year anniversary. I'm very excited about that. This program has been around and has been, as we said earlier, the gem of what's going on. And it's really the beginning of a good day for me to walk down and see these students come in the mornings, do their jobs on our campus, get dressed, hop on the city bus, and navigate the city bus on their own, go to their jobs and come back to the campus. Um, it's a very, very um, highlight of my day each day. <clears throat> Currently, as far as TPYA goes, we have two classes that are actually on our Career Readiness Academy campus, and we have one class that is at the Watson School of Education. As we said earlier, uh, these are young adult, adults ranging in age from 18 to 22 years old. Um, they are transitioning from school to adult life preparing these individuals to function as independently as possible in our community and on their own. The content of the program revolves around independent living, employment, and post-secondary education. Some things that our very own students say during, before, from what they hear from friends and after they leave, TPYA is awesome. I like how <laughs> teachers are helpful to everyone and I enjoy going out in the community with my friends and learning new things like cooking, cleaning, trying to become more independent. I like going on the city bus to Target and bowling. I like to fish in the ability garden. I like to cook pizza at school. I learn how to get to and from my job at Walmart without anyone's help. I learn how to work in the school cafeteria, the kitchen, so that I can do and go out and get a job. 
And I'll tell you, those are all things that our students are doing daily. I'm not sure how many of you have taken the opportunity to try and navigate the Wave Transit bus system. <laughs> but that was one of our first goals, and it is not easy. <laughs> but our students at TPYA can tell you where the 101 goes, where the 102 goes, where Fordham is to transfer, all the good stuff. So things are working for you. <clears throat> um, new to us last year and continue to grow is our Career Readiness E-Academy. Um, this has been an um, initiative that uh, Dr. Markley and um, the senior staff came to us about offering possibilities for students who are currently homeschooled to come and enroll under our Career Readiness Academy umbrella and be able to either dual enroll or become a student within our ADM and be able to work off campus. So these students come in after being um, talked to through their uh, parents or contacting Sarah Gubix or Al Bryant about the possibility of this. Um, they come in and meet with us. We have currently 12 students enrolled, eight in high school, four in middle school. If we figure it's a good fit, then we sit down and discuss the curriculum, goals, things that they're gonna need to be successful and get that final um, diploma, of course, which is the ultimate goal. Uh, the students come in for the first at least 10 days. They come in and they are actually part of our Career Readiness Academy staff. Um, our student population, I apologize. Um, and once they figure and show and prove to us they can navigate the North Carolina Virtual Public School System site, we let them go home and work from home. They come back and check in periodically, um, not just for scheduling, to see how they're doing with the coursework, if they have any issues. If we notice anything along the way, we will pull them back in and have them back on campus to try and get them caught up, to give them any kind of assistance through our current staff as well. Next, they had a young lady graduate to NC, UNC Honor School last year mm -hmm. out of that program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, we did. She was very, very, very good. <coughs> and lastly, the highlight of the community, <laughs> our Career Readiness Academy at Mosley Pre-K Center. Um, <clears throat> this has been something that we were so excited to have happen. We were fortunate enough to have the support of our board, you guys, of course, our senior staff. Mr. Shell's been out there a whole lot um, in support of what's going on with the pre-K center. 45 three-year-olds came walking through our doors um, after a series of renovations, a big ribbon cutting session, um, and a lot of happy parents. Um, on October 25th, the official ribbon cutting took place. Uh, the students are maturing, thank goodness. They're learning a lot of things. We've all seen a lot of the reports and data showing how good it is and how great it is to get these students in the setting as soon as possible. So this has been a great move forward. Uh, we were recently, as of about two weeks ago, officially um, giving our five-star license rating. So we're right there in the mix as far as that goes. Um, it's a very good point to talk with about parents when they come in and think about coming to our place. As I said earlier, we opened our doors in October 2017, three classrooms, 45 students, one on-site family specialist, three teachers and three assistants. Um, this all could not have been made possible without the support from our district, from our senior staff, early childhood education department. Ms. Shannon Smiles, the director, has been an absolute, in her terms, rock star. So I don't use that term much, but she's a rock star. Um, her and her staff have been very supportive of what's going on and pulling me in and trying to bring me back up to speed on how things have come in because it's been five or six years since I've dealt with pre-K and things have changed a lot over the years as you can imagine. But we're very excited, look forward to continued growth with all of our programs, including pre-K. Our students at pre-K are also getting the opportunities to be exposed to other opportunities in the community. Um, families have exposure to these supports, dental, vision, hearing, um, Nourish NC is working with us. We have 20 pre-K families who are being served through that program. 20 students received bikes and helmets this year from the Make a Child. 25 have signed up for the Imagination Library. All 45 of our students are part of the Raising Reader program. So once again, some very good things happening there. Questions? I just have a comment. Yes, uh, sir. This really is a program that changes lives. and. Uh, I'm glad you embraced it the way you have, and um, you know just.
following up on that, we were very fortunate that the county commissioners embraced it and helped us to make that happen. I thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you. Just a comment about the building. They're in a building that was actually closed when I first got here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the board, some of you who were here at that time, committed to renovating and upgrading that building. And if you go in that building now, it's really, they've got probably the prettiest backyard of any, of any school mm -hmm. in, in the district. Upsetting. So, mm -hmm. Eddie, your staff did a great job getting that building back together. Uh, how do the big kids and little kids get along with each other? Um, the older students could not wait to have the interactions. Um, and it has already grown to a point where it's getting very competitive between our Career Readiness Academy students and our TPY students. But the TPY students have the advantage because they're on the same hall. So they, <laughs> but uh, the interaction as far as reading, um, a little mentoring going already. So we're doing some good things to try and build that uh, moving forward as well. Are any of the older students parents of the three year olds? No, ma'am. Good question. <laughs> no, ma'am. We have some former students from back in my older days or younger days that are now parents, <laughs> but uh, no. All right, explain the Philadelphia connection for the board. Um, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, and I moved to North Carolina in junior high and in the metropolis of Swansboro High School. <laughs> and I went back to Philadelphia every summer because I was brought here kicking and screaming um, until my grandmother passed away and then I fully embraced Wilmington, North Carolina when I went to college at UNCW and I've been here ever since, but managed to hold on to my Eagles, my Flyers, and my Phillies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, that, that is just the program. As I said, it's a little bit of everything in that school. Uh, and if you ever get an opportunity just to go by, it's a great place to go when you're having a bad day. All right, next item on the agenda, superintendent's report, anything? None. Okay. Consensus items. Personnel, <coughs> Dr. Wellman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Request the board approve the personnel matters as presented. Move for approval. Second. second. I have a motion, a second, <coughs> any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It is approved. Next item, budget amendments, Ms. Small. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to mention that the um, state budget included funding for our summer reading camps of just over half a million dollars. Um, we also are moving some of our Medicaid reserve into the special ed, ed um, budget, um, 588,000. And um, we are requesting to transfer 300,000 from bond contingency to the Myrtle Grove renovation project. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, just one. Sure. You say you're moving uh, from reserves over. What does that leave in reserves? Um, I don't know that I have that on the top of my head, but you may know. Um, uh, at the end of the year, we're expected to have 1.2. Yeah, I think maybe 1.2 if, if we spend everything we're budgeting. But we can get you the, the exact number. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All right, any opposed? <coughs> it is approved. Thank you. Next item, old business, redistricting, Appendix H, with my name on it. We have, there's been a lot of discussion about redistricting, and we have heard from a lot of parents. And it's been my observation from what we have heard is that a lot of parents, they are concerned about overcrowding, but they are also concerned about moving their kids around. And so I asked Mr. Anderson a question. <coughs> Let me get it back up here. because I, I asked him about the enrollment at Laney. And my letter says, and if I'm wrong, Mr. Anderson, please let me know. The message he sent me was, as requested, I took our enrollment projections for Laney High School and compared them with and without redistricting. The difference for Laney is approximately 77 students, and without redistricting, the number of students over capacity peaks at 393 in the 2022-2023 year. So my question, the reason I raised it was 
I've had a couple of meetings with Dr. Markley, with Mr. Anderson, and the long and the short, moving students around, I mean, actually, this is less than I thought. If we talked about senior privilege, potentially junior privilege, potentially sibling privilege, it seemed to me that in the end, <coughs> we were not moving that many students, and we have heard from a lot of people, in my opinion, who are opposed to having their children moved, whether it's for because they're involved in activities, and if we move them, they lose their, for lack of a better description, seniority that they may have as sophomores and juniors in other schools. So I wanted to bring this back up because I think we need to do something, and I'm just I'm looking for some guidance. I move that we definitely postpone redistricting. All right, I have a motion. Till when? Indefinite. I mean, you have an, it's amazing that we're even making an indefinite motion. I understand. That's just amazing that you would actually make that motion. Well, I, would, I don't, I don't I would, really see why it would be that amazing in and, that. That you indefinitely postpone uh, redistricting when we recognize there's a problem. We've all recognized in October we voted seven to zero to move forward with redistricting. Five weeks ago, we voted six to one to have a final vote. The only thing that's happened in the last five weeks is we're five weeks closer to an election. The, the thing I don't find that amazing <clears throat> is that when we first started talking about redistricting, senior privilege was brought up, then junior privilege was brought up, then sibling privilege was brought up, and then signature program privilege was brought up. And I simply asked the question then, who are we going to move? It makes no sense to me that if we're going to do all these things, enhance some of these programs in the schools, I would rather follow a course of letting parents make the decision if they want to move their child from, say, Laney, for example, to New Hanover High School for the Lyceum program or the baccalaureate program at Hogwarts or whatever it may be. Point is, we have a lot going on also on the middle school level with the schools that are being built, that things that will have to take place there to uh, eliminate the overcrowding. We definitely have to redistrict in the, what, the 2021, when the uh, Porter's Neck goes <coughs> back to uh, Blair and College Park. So, and I have said from the very beginning, I would rather wait, because you really don't know what you're gonna run into on the middle school level and some of these other things, I would rather wait and do it all at one time. That's not it's been true. my position. That has not been your position. You and I sat, sat in on the class size committee and starting last August, and you were a, one of the architects of doing them separately. The Is one that one not one. true? To doing them separately, to doing the middle school and high school right. before the You were one of the architects of doing them separately. So when you say you wanted to do them together the whole time, that's not true. When we right? were discussing the class size numbers, that is correct. But then when we started throwing out all these other things, the different types of uh, privileges that were gonna be allowed to remain, it just makes no sense because I certainly don't want to move at any grade level a segment of the population and then turn around a year later or so and then move that same area again. Well, that's, that's why to me it would make sense because the numbers that. are going down and it might work out with, with the parents making the choices as to what school they're gonna be in. So just, just so I'm clear, you, originally wanted to do middle school and high school and elementary school separate but now you don't want to because of the privileges correct not and, necessarily just the privileges okay and, because at, at that point we really don't know how many it would affect that we're going to move so so you're you're saying you don't want to move one group of high school and then the next year later move that same group i don't think there's been any proposal that i've, I've seen unless you, you've seen something that moves high schools two years in a row, middle schools two years in a row, elementary schools, we obviously haven't seen those yet. But I don't think there's anything out there that shows that we're gonna move a high school student and then the next year move them again. I, I'm not sure where, that, that's, there are no facts that we have ever seen, other than you saying that, that have ever shown that we're gonna move students twice. And, and Mr. Anderson or, or 
Dr. Markley, have, have, have y'all ever presented anything that we're going to move high school students twice? No, okay. So let's let's stop telling the public that we're going to move students twice year after year. I did not say that we were going to move them, sir. I just simply said I don't want to be put in a position to maybe have to do that. I also want to consider the elementary areas and also the middle school areas when we do this. And as I've also said, I would much rather see any type of movement here take place, parents making that decision. Parents making the decision for redistricting or us listening to parents and as a board, us making the decision? I think all of that would be included. Right, absolutely, and I thought that's but what But I think doing. if you enhance the signature programs, which was what I thought the last meeting a lot of that was about, was that it would allow parents, if they wanted to, for their children to transfer from one school to another through the open enrollment, to attend those schools based upon the signature programs. And, and I guess, I, and the other question I, I would have when we're looking at these, this graph that came up, this Excel spreadsheet is, and I don't remember correctly, but we haven't even actually agreed to a redistricting proposal, have we? Have it what? We I haven't don't. agreed to a proposal yet, correct? Okay. So how do we know the figures if we haven't even agreed to a proposal yet? I don't really know what figures you're talking about. Students. How, how do we know how many students are going to go to specific high schools? Again, this is Laney. I'm not sure where, where the other stuff is. But how do we know how many students are going to go to specific high schools if we haven't even agreed is, to a redistricting your question That's how true. it came up with the differential of 77? Yes, sir. Because just, and you're right, Mr. Shell, because just five weeks ago, if you look at the, the PowerPoint presentation to us um, under option B, um, the number was substantially less at, at Laney than what's showing today. I mean, it's 80 students less. So instead of being the 77, it would actually be 157. So I'm not <coughs> sure what redistricting proposal we went by, um, but they're just, and again, we haven't even agreed to one, and that was why I thought we were gonna continue discussion so we could listen to more public input. Um, you know, I sat with, with with the principal of Laney a couple of weeks ago, and she told me how, how overcrowded it was. You know, and I don't think overpopulation, uh, I mean, she was saying that there's, there's stuffed in there in a lot of those classes. Um, I spoke with her also, and she was here earlier, and I Jeez. don't think she mm -hmm. would mind me sharing, that the numbers that were going to be of students moving mm -hmm. out still left an overcrowded situation. Yeah, so we weren't really resolving that issue. Her main concern is third period lunch because you go to class, then you're interrupted for lunch, and you go back and finish that course, that class. She needs more cafeteria space, and she needs more tables. But she is willing to keep it as it is rather than losing some of these students that um, are already so engaged in different programs and uh, activities and clubs at the school. We obviously had different conversations because... Mr. But, Higgins, but I, I under, did you I understand hear her say basically she's not that a, information? I heard her say that she could manage the school. Yes. So, I mean, I guess as a board, we've, we've started the process and, and a motion to an indefinitely delay redistricting. Um, I understand some of these, Ms. Kavanaugh, I understand you don't want to discuss it. I've, I've tried to discuss it with you. I've asked for meetings. Um, just five weeks ago, I asked what your opinion about a meeting was, getting the board together so we could continue discussion. Um, fortunately for Mr. Shell and, and Ms. Eastep, we, we had a meeting with, with Dr. Markley. It, when you realized there was that there was that meeting instead of asking to be involved in the meeting you criticized us and i think what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with some sort of proposal um, and listening to the public input and and looking at long-range plans whether it be using trask um, or or murray and trying to come up with a plan that actually that actually works and instead of doing that instead of fighting the process it would be nice if 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 some other board members were, were to to participate and share their experiences and maybe we could move forward and come up with some some sort of process but but delaying redistricting indefinitely 
that does prefer. absolutely does nothing for our students and, and it honestly I don't know what indefinite means how long indefinite is I, I suppose it's 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 into the next year after, after the the whole process is the whole election process is over but it just doesn't make sense to me to do that because we're not here um, for that we're here to actually address some of these issues and burying our head in the sand is, is not going to do that I would prefer that we do all of the redistricting at one time instead of piecemeal it high school one time middle school one time elementary one time well I prefer that if we're going to disrupt <clears throat> families lives it would be one time um, we could say postpone it until we do all of it at one time but I didn't want to put a time period on it so that we would have to <clears throat> necessarily rush in doing it. So that's why I said indefinite. But I would prefer for us to do it all at one time. I don't, and again, I don't know what's changed between all these votes we've had um, where we are today. Um, but I guess the, the issue is, and we've heard from, from Mr. Anderson as well as Dr. Markley, you know, we have um, issues coming up with our uh, middle school renovations and originally if you remember correctly Ms. Cavanaugh the reason why it was a 7-0 vote is because we wanted to make sure that with the construction processes that we're going to have um, at the middle schools starting next year I believe at um, Mr. Anderson and Roland Grice Middle Grove is that correct, That's correct. for that um, that we would need additional space um, at those schools and so we were going to go ahead and implement um, the following year when Noble had their major renovation um, that we would have um, that space available if I, and I believe that was the that was why we did we wanted to do middle school um, the 1920 school year is that correct, That's correct. and isn't there a um, if we were to, to miss that um, that window and, and delay that my understanding there's gonna be a substantial up to three million dollar cost to the school system um, for additional uh, modular units if we aren't able to um, house those those students at Noble is that correct Basically, we can, we can redistrict to reduce overcrowding, or we can provide temporary space to accommodate the students at their school. How, how much, what would and, the cost um, of that well, be? Well, our, our, and just looking at, um, you know, preliminarily, uh, we were estimating about $4 million. Okay, so if we postpone redistricting for one year and do it in 2020, it's going to cost our school system $4 million. Well, I, I think that that... When we were looking at that, we were not looking at any postponing redistricting. We were looking at providing a long-term solution in lieu of redistricting. Okay. So that number could be less. All right. So it'll be a substantial amount e either way. Is that is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I don't. It, it's it's a struggle for me after we've listened to what we've listened to, whether it be um, the teachers. Uh, whether it be capital projects, we spent the entire meeting last week, uh, last month, talking about safety issues. To spend two, to to waste two or three million dollars because we want to delay re, uh, middle school redistricting by one year. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but I can speak for myself that um, using that two to three million dollars as capital projects and, and maybe addressing some of these safety issues is uh, outweighs um, delaying the redistricting process one year. Mr. Anderson. Uh, <clears throat> in my understanding, uh, what you're saying is that if we do nothing, uh, that we're going to have significant overcrowding in a couple of middle schools that will require uh, some temporary space. If we redistrict, you could avoid that in the middle school arena. We, we have, um, we really have two issues that we're dealing with. Yeah. You know, if you think about <clears throat> our school system um, and our capacities versus enrollment, there's really two issues. The first is this population bubble that we've talked about. And we know that um, this year we'll be promoting, you know, the highest fifth grade class, approximately 200 more students than in previous years. So those students are moving into the middle schools. So, um, you know, for three years, uh, we'll be, you know, dealing with that population bubble in the middle schools and then the following four years in our high schools. So, you know, that's gonna be affecting our secondary schools for seven years. 
Yeah, that's, and that's, that's the first issue. The second issue is just growth in our county. I mean, obviously our county is growing. You, you drive around New Hanover County or anywhere in Wilmington and, and you can witness that for yourself. Um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, I, I found interesting in the demographic projections, uh, for as long as I've been here, I've, I've noticed uh, that we have always had our kindergarten class was, was more students than our senior class. Um, but that is getting ready to flip. You know, in the next, next couple of years, we're projecting that we'll actually be graduating more students than we'll be bringing in in kindergarten. So, and I bring that up because it, it, and that's about 200 students. So when you look at the demographic report and you just look at the bottom line and you think we're really not, you know, it's flat, you know, or we're only growing by 200 students, you're, you're not taking into consideration that deficit. And so we may actually, the growth that's occurring in the county is, is affecting us by 400 students, but we, we're making up that 200 student deficit. Now these are, I mean, these are round numbers. <laughs> But um, just, to, just to explain, so we are definitely having growth in our county and we're projecting growth in our county. But that's another way that that bubble is gonna be affecting us over, over the next several years. So, you know, looking at that population bubble and the growth in our county, um, you know, we, we were trying to come up with a plan that would get us over the hump of the population bubble and, and I'll, but also provide a long-term solution uh, to, that addresses the growth. And I, you know, I think we could do that uh, with redistricting or we could do that with uh, temporary space, modular facilities, or we could do that with a combination of the two. Is it your belief that uh, as painful as redistricting is, that that could eliminate if, if done properly that eliminate the need for uh, these modulars? I'm not, I don't think it's gonna completely eliminate the need for the modulars. Um, you know, I think that it would significantly reduce the need. Okay. But I, I think to get through that seven year period, you know, we're gonna have to relocate some existing modulars or uh, provide some temporary well, modulars. Well, we spent a fair amount of time talking about high school. Now we're talking about middle school. Um, so off the top of your head, you're over at Noble. Can you kind of just give us a ballpark of where we're very, very over and where we have significant capacity in the middle schools? Well, we have, I wouldn't say we have significant capacity in any of our middle schools. Um, you know, we have the, the most, um, the most overcrowded schools are gonna, next year will be Noble and, um, and Murray. <clears throat> With redistricting uh, being implemented um, in 1920, we knew we had one year to get through and we could make some temporary arrangements, be very creative in, in um, creating some classrooms you know, for that one year. Uh, without redistricting, I think the better solution would be to go ahead and provide some temporary modular buildings. Um, and, and we would put those, you know, at, uh, at Noble and, uh, and, and at Murray. Um, if we were, you know, if we were just going to purchase um, modulars, you know, I think that, um, you know, we are looking at a $4 million number. But I think we ha also have the opportunity to, to cut that number down because um, you know, when you, obviously we're gonna be providing some temporary modulars for swing space for uh, renovations to our four schools. And we really need to look at that and when those modulars are gonna be there, when that construction is gonna take place, and is it possible you know, to, to go ahead and, and leverage those dollars you know, to, to really get us through the renovations as well as um, any overcrowding. So <clears throat> I think that um, you know, there is an opportunity uh, to bring that, the $4 million I would say is that's, that's kind of a worst case scenario. 
I think there's a, a good opportunity that, uh, or a good possibility that that would, could be much less. Uh, if you wanted to look at a combination, you know, maybe we make some, uh, some adjustments, uh, some tweaks in lines as well as modulars, uh, I think you could bring that number down even further. So you don't see the need for uh, another middle school to be built in the next five to seven years? You're thinking through redistricting and if we had to some modulars, we can avoid that expenditure? No, I think that, um, I think in looking at the current current capacities and, and our growth projections that, um, you know, we do need another middle school. Uh, I'm, I'm not considering you know, modulars as a long-term solution. You know, that they may get us through five to seven years, but that five to 10 range, I would hope that we would be looking at a more permanent facility uh, in a new middle school. Well, that had been my understanding for some time and you hadn't said that. So I'm I, sorry. That's why I was trying to pull that out of you a little. So uh, we, it sounds like we can avoid uh, in the next year or two some uh, modular expense if we move forward with redistricting a little earlier than what's being talked about and then plan long term to have a middle school uh, a, a construction or at least planning and then further con uh, construction later on. We need to communicate those things to our county commissioners who foot that bill. And that's why I've been a little bit insistent on talking about some of the longer range issues as part of as part of, of uh, redistricting or part of in lieu of redistricting more modulars. So I think this board's got some I th this has been meaningful. I think this board's got some tough decisions to make. I do have one follow-up question. Eddie, you said that there were no middle schools with capacity right now. It was my understanding that we do we do have one. We have Holly Shelter. Is that not true? Yeah, that's the, yeah. I, I uh, <coughs> what I was what I meant is I don't think there's any that are significantly under capacity. Holly Shelter does have excess capacity. You're correct. Okay, thank you. Well, Holly Shelter would be the only one because I know it. Williston, there was a little bit of space there, but with closing Virgo, you know that that's going to be taken up. But also, as Mr. Shell mentioned, that I know there's been talk for quite some time about the Sidbury Road complex with the land out there that, uh, you know, because we've talked for years about Laney Trask, you know, move, turn that into part of Laney's uh, campus and then build uh, out there on Sidbury Road, which would eliminate that problem. And that, that is still our current long range plan. And you know, whether we're redistricting or providing modulars or doing a combination of both, what we're really talking about is how do we get from today until that point when, the, when these uh, new facilities are open. Mr. Anson, can I, ask, can I ask you a question about that? We, the projections show the 10 year projection for high schools. So about from today, to 2018, about a 350 student increase. Is that, a, is that correct in, in our high schools? I think that's what we had. Would you say that again? I didn't hear all the projections about the amount of high school students we have today, uh -huh. as opposed to the, what the amount we'll have in 10 years, and I believe we talked about this last Friday at our meeting, is about 350 students. Is that the project, our projection, show? That's correct. Okay, and then um, so we have 40 students currently at um, uh, our, um, our sorry SeaTac, and with an anticipated in five to six years 400 students. Correct? Is that is that about how many we would ideally like to have at SeaTac? Like to, but because of the small entry classes, right. it'll be a little. It'll probably take six years to get to that number. So the the point that I'm making is in 10 years, hopefully, we'll be full up and running at SeaTac. So that's an additional 350, 360 students of space, which to me means, since we're developing that additional space, the high school projected growth from now until 10 years is flat. Is that, is that accurate? Would that be accurate to say? Well, in between that time, we actually go up to over 9,000 students. Understand, understand. And we can't build up, we're not gonna be able to build a middle school between 
for the next six years, seven years. Is that and, so? And we got to figure also, out what we're going to do during the next the, this part. And but I would also say that um, we um, we update our enrollment projections frequently mm -hmm. um, because I've always said I think enrollment projections are very good from zero to five years, but when you start projecting enrollment from five to ten years out, I think it really is a projection, and that a lot a lot can change. A absolutely, and I understand that, but we're, the information you've provided to us. That's correct. We, uh, we have to rely right. on some information, and that's the information you've relied to us. So taking those 360 students that are going to SeaTech out, our high school populations now projected, and I understand it can change, into 10 years is flat. So my question is, as we're talking about doing Murray and we're talking about doing Trask as ninth grade centers, um, and then building two middle schools to accommodate Murray and Trask, um, which would be around $90 million, $45 million for each middle school? Yes, $45 million for a middle school. And we're looking right now at a redistricting process that we, we can um, redistrict these high schools, and um, each one of them would basically be a little bit over capacity, but as we've heard, um, especially from even Mr. Sharm, she, she can manage where she is. Obviously, she'll be able to manage it better um, if she has less students there. Uh, my concern is, is that even though we're talking about spending $90 million on, on potentially two new middle schools, do we really need them? Can't that money be used elsewhere? It just seems to me if the projections well, are flat right now for the high schools, we don't need to build two, two new middle schools. I don't think we... Um I don't think we're adequately housing and providing for our high schools today, for the high school students. I think that our high schools are currently overcrowded, and even with uh, flat being flat over a 10-year period, you know we're, they will, will still be overcrowded, and that doesn't um, that doesn't bring into play, um, you know, how do our high schools, existing high schools, compare to what we would build in a new high school today. And, and I would tell you there are a lot of, there are a lot of facilities, uh, <coughs> spaces that we would build in a new high school today that don't exist at, um, at Ash or at um, Hoggard and at Laney and New Hanover. Mm -hmm. So where I understand what you're saying and you're correct, that in a 10 year period, our projections show our high school capacity flat. But the, the other side of that is, I think there's a need today. And, and even with it being flat, that need doesn't go away. So a need that our high schools are overcrowded today, a need to do something today, is that what you're, you A need that our high schools are overcrowded, our, a need that okay. um, we have inadequate facilities and outdated facilities and um, outdated buildings and infrastructure. And where, just last question, this spreadsheet, did you develop this spreadsheet? Is this a spread Excel sheet that you you developed that was the the Laney? Yes. Yes, that's a that is actually a spreadsheet that um, was part of the demographic report. I just put the summary on the bottom. What's the difference um, in why is there such a uh, substantial? First of all, I guess what redistricting plan did you use? Um, well, the last redistricting plan was we actually submitted three options. Right. And. Uh, the, the numbers that I believe we used, the 2204, was a combination of um, two of the plans where we were in, um, include, I don't, honestly, I don't know if we included landfall. I know we I included everything else. But whether or not we moved, uh, that number has, has landfall being moved to New Hanover, um, I don't think it does. I'd have to go back and, and verify that. Because I think the option 1B, the information that you provided to us back in February, showed a current overcapacity of 395 students at Laney. And after um, option 1B were to take effect, the overcapacity would be about 201 students, which is about a 50% drop. So that was just was substantially different than what option 1B was. So, but that makes sense if you didn't include. And it could like be too. Um, I use the most current membership numbers in this spreadsheet, and so there there may be okay. um, some differences in the current membership. And these numbers are uh, month one memberships that we used in redistricting.
I was trying to provide the most, most up-to-date okay. information. Let me see. I currently have a motion. I do not have a second. I have a second. Okay, I have a second. Any further questions or discussion about Ms. Cavanaugh's motion to suspend redistricting indefinitely? Yes, sir. No, uh, I, I do, but I thought Ms. Nicholson. Ms. I have. I'm on the wrong side. <laughs> I I understand all the variables that we've talked about, and and I think we've added so many exemptions that we really haven't helped Laney. But to put it off indefinitely is really going to be worrisome to the students and the parents. I'm willing they to change that too doing all redistricting at the same time. Which would be what year? Year after next. If I remember correctly, is that when we're doing elementary and? Uh, Eddie, what's the elementary deadline? Well, the, the year that, um, that the elementary redistricting would be implemented is uh, the 2020-21 school year. <coughs> the planning would have to take place during the 1920 school year. Is that what you're amending? Your, yes. You're changing your motion? Yes. So okay. under that proposal, you want to do middle school redistricting in 2021, is that correct? I want to do everything at one time. That would be in 2020, is that correct? In order to, to get it ready for the 2021 oh. yes, school year. We'd have to do it ahead of right. year on. ahead. Sorry. Parents need to know. Okay. When we originally talked about, to your point, I think we were trying to give elementary students or families up to two years notice to know exactly what, and I think that's why we developed the original elementary. I think Mr. Higgins said 18 months, isn't it, am I correct, Mr. Higgins, 18 months you wanted to give notice to those students, and I had said up to two years if we were able to do it. I'm, I'm good with either 18 or, or two years. I'm trying to figure out exactly. Two years is, is would be um, in September. Of? Uh, Five months. Oh, you, uh, well, the mo current motion, I'm trying to figure out when, when Ms. Cavanaugh is projecting. I thought we were redistricting elementary in the 2021 year. Oh, I, I thought that's when we were that's going the, to that's the effective, approve it. The, it's the effective date. So you would have to we do have it to talk in about 2019. It yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to be looking at maps for elementary school and looking at maps for middle school and looking at maps for high school all at the same time. I, that to me seems overwhelming. And I mean, it, I, I, I totally get that we want to take parent, you know, the parent comment into, into consideration. And I think we have, but that doesn't, this doesn't take the schools into, um, into consideration at all or the students into consideration or the faculty into consideration or the school balance into consideration i mean i've sit i've sat here and, and I'm, I'm 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 sorry i'm very tired and i'm not going to use correct grammar apologize in advance but I, I we are completely missing one really big piece of this with the high schools and that's that's balance we have height, we have New Hanover that, and we talked about this, and we've just pushed that way off to the side. New Hanover's, uh, the, 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 the poverty numbers are, are, are w much higher than the rest of the schools, and we're just gonna let that sit there. And we're gonna let Hoggard sit way under until 2021, because we feel like it. And then we're gonna try to address all these maps all together for no particular reason. I don't understand why. So if, we're, if you're going to vote that way, you're going to vote that way. But it's not in the best interest of the schools. It's just, to me, fairly arbitrary because we're, we're, we're trying to please some parents, not all of them. Some of them might want to move, 
We're hearing from the noisy ones who don't. And they can. But we're never going to make everybody happy. We're not going to make the elementary school uh, parents happy. To me, the high school students are the ones we do have to take care of more. I didn't like the idea of moving them in the fall because you're because of all the activities. The elementary school students are a little bit more portable. We have to be careful, careful with the high school students. But to push that out this far makes no sense to me whatsoever. And, and Mrs. I, I totally agree with what you're saying about the socioeconomic numbers. So I apologize if I missed that. But I think one of the great discussions that we were having <clears throat> before this was tabled um, was looking at areas maybe to balance New Hanover High School. Because again, it's, it's a great high school. And um, if you look at some of the numbers that were presented to us, there's certainly an imbalance with some of the other high schools. So I was encouraged by some of the discussions we were having and um, the momentum that we were building to maybe making some of those decisions and all of a sudden it was just tabled and now to say to table it indefinitely or for three years that just it there's there's no way that's in the best best interest of our students and especially as Miss Eastup said that our high school students which really are the most impressionable right now I, I ask that we have a work session because whenever the three board members wanted to meet with Dr. Markley, we couldn't add another person because then we'd have a quorum. So I asked that we have a work session so we could all hear the same thing, right. ask all the questions and hash it out. Nothing else being presented. Just sit here and talk through it, get Mr. Anderson to have everything ready for us. And I don't think we really, I don't have enough information. I have these numbers, but I don't have a solution. And I don't want to be put to a vote. I'm not running for anything, so. <laughs> well, Ms. Nichols, with all, with all due respect, you actually proposed two meetings in March, two, yes. two, two work sessions, which was a great idea. They were, this board decided not to do it. So I don't know, uh, unless we're going to sit up here right now and say, let's, plan a work session so we can talk about redistricting with we're all here right now everyone's watching is everyone in agreement that maybe we need to have I think Miss Nichols is I, I am is everyone in agreement that we need to have a uh, redistricting workshop here in the next next couple of weeks so we can discuss redistricting I mean I'd like to hear also what would be nice would be if there was any way and I don't know how you would come up with it <clears throat> the numbers of how things kept changing as far as senior privilege junior privilege sibling privileges signature program privileges but there's no senior there's let, no, let there's, me finish please uh how could we come up with a group of numbers as to how that might impact what we might have to do as far as redistricting can, can, that's my whole point understand the privilege and if you remember correctly the, the first of all there's no specialty privilege specialty programs are totally outside redistricting but they were brought been, in at these previous discussions have, no they weren't they, yes, were, they were they were totally separate and they, the specialty programs are totally separate from redistricting. We had presentations to well, try to build them. Now, but, but you put it in there that they could remain there if they were in that program. But specialty signature, programs. Signature programs are what are at the high schools right now. Okay. Specialty would be Mosley. I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I meant the signatures. So okay. we're, we're talking okay. about um, STEM, Lyceum, right. um, and the IB it, program, right. and the Marine the program. Traditional high school. Totally separate. Am I, am Mr. Anderson, Dr. Markley, am I correct? Totally separate from redistricting, those programs? Yeah, but they were parents used those as part of. I think that was often they were brought they in. They were brought in as yeah. part of the comment section. Okay. But in terms of actually redistricting, specialty programs are separate in and of themselves. And, and I think the reason why we were trying correct me if I'm wrong, reason why we were trying to talk about the junior senior privilege is as a way of accommodation in a transition year of one year to implement our full scale high school um, redistricting. Because we heard from a lot of parents that were saying, I have a sophomore in, in at Laney, Ashley, Hoggard, Hanover. Um, they've been there for two years, and now you're going to yank the rug out of them. So I, when I introduced those programs, the intention to do that was to make sure that you actually have kids. Um, it, it does help. It helped the numbers. But then I'm not necessarily opposed to introducing those things, but that's why I made the point. Who are we going to actually move? But eventually we'd move everyone. You eventually, move eventually you'd, you'd move them. Eventually, the lines would be changed. These were options to give parents a transition year to, to do it. 
eventually you're not going to have junior senior privilege because you're not going to be eligible. I'm talking about the signature programs privilege. No, we're not talking about it. Signature programs are totally signature. separate. I know that, but that was brought in that if they were to apply for that, then like the Lyceum stay. program in New Hanover, they'd be able to go there. Right. If they wanted to go to the back. That's well, what they that's do what now. That's what I'm saying. Right. What I mean, do you mean it wasn't if, introduced? If, if at Laney, for example, if the proposal <coughs> was to, to move, let's say somebody in Landfall, to Hanover, but they wanted to stay at Laney for the STEM program, all they had to do was ask to stay at Laney for the STEM program, and they'd stay at Laney. If they met the qualifications, well, the yeah. But I thought that was like pretty much open, from what I heard from yeah. Mr. Sean. That you know, it's just a series of classes that they take, but that's that's the protected. Uh, same thing with uh, Ashley. If somebody wanted to, was being moved, but had a, a desire to go into the marine science program, then they could come to us and say, "I want to go into marine science," and they could stay at. So therefore, who are we going to actually move? I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Higgins, let me say that um, I'm in complete agreement with what Ms. Nichols is saying in that um, we do not have enough information. And it's not because the staff hadn't tried, but um, I will say that um, what we, I think the tip of the iceberg tonight was that uh, if we don't redistrict, we're going to be writing a big check. And if we put it off, we're going to be writing a big check for temporary housing. We need to send our county commissioners a message whether we need uh, to start planning for a middle school or not. And that's been the, my biggest um, reservation, uh, it's a nice word, uh, for, from all of this has been that I don't think we've had that discussion as seven member board to talk about those kinds of things so that you you kind of plan what what your long-term needs are uh, based on information from the experts and uh, we've got uh, a demographic report I don't want to hate hesitate to say this but we have a demographic report that says one thing and we've got uh, planners with the city and the county that says, oh no, you're about to grow as much as 50% in 20 years. That's over 100,000 people. I can't help but think 100,000 people, you're gonna have a few uh, <laughs> kids in the schools more than what we're talking about is flat, no disrespect. But at the end of the day, I think we have, uh, have my suggestion is that um, I ask uh, Ms. Cavanaugh to table her motion and that uh, we uh, schedule a, a work session where we can talk about all these things. And if one work session doesn't get it done, we plan another. Well, let me just simply say, I have been through, what have we been through? Probably eight redistrictings in our time on the board. Um, and unfortunately, what has happened with this, and, and Mr. Waltman may disagree with me, <coughs> this is the most rushed redistricting plan I have ever been involved in. I mean, we have had plans that we have spent a year having, as you said, work sessions, meetings, pulling a segment here, pulling a segment there. I mean, I, I fear that what this whole talk about New Hanover and the composition of its its enrollment socioeconomic begins to sound like going back to busing and, and I don't think the people of New Hanover County want that but I do think we need to dis discuss it L let me let me comment since you're pointing to me about well, you're that. the one who said it. I never said busing, and I understand you're running for a re-election. No, you're trying hey, to do hey, that. I, I that's inappropriate, that. I didn't, Mr. I, Higgins. Not, hey, I never said. I never said you anything said about you, busing. You, you're Absolutely reducing not. the social economics by four percent. You're not going to get it down to forty or something. That you talked about how Harvard is. You're going to have to pick up students someplace and take them to Harvard and bring Harvard students to New Hanover if you want to get the social economic enrollment down to about thirty-eight. 
39 percent. And, and you know what? There's, there's never been, we've never even talked about numbers doing it like that, Mr. Higgins. You just Higgins. said it. That I wanted to get to 38, 39 no, percent? But, you, but you, you're talking about improving for, by 4 percent, going from 49 to 45? I think that's what it goes to. And, and that's what was talked about. Uh, I think that it was 49.39 to 44.35. Okay, um, 6 percent. And you're not changing the districts but all that much. That's not, and that's you're not, not busing kids. not doing a whole lot kids. different than what we're doing now. Well, anyway. No, not, not. <clears throat> I, I, are you, Ms. Kavanaugh, are you willing to table when we have a uh, work session with this as the sole topic of discussion? Yes, but I don't want anybody to misinterpret and Yes, I'm running for re-election. I'm not doing or saying anything. I have the guts to say what I mean and to do what I say. And I challenge anyone to disagree with that because throughout the years, I have said exactly what I think and have done exactly what I thought was best. So I think you're hitting below the belt when you keep throwing that out to people. I have attempted to be very respectful, quiet, supportive tonight. And I don't think that can be said about everyone at this table. I am willing to table it, but I don't want anyone to misinterpret. I truly think that we ought to do all redistricting at the same time. And if I table it, I don't want that to be misinterpreted as the fact that I am willing to break it up into different successive times. I understand. So we need to agree on a time when we have adequate time. And I'm, when I say adequate time, we need to be com come prepared to spend five or six things. hours. We've done that in the past and we can do it in the future. Right. Uh, not I be, do not, not a, see it happening uh, in one work two, session. Mm -hmm. I Having, oh, you said eight yeah. redistricting. Right. I've probably been through 12. Uh, what, uh, so uh, I know exactly what it's going to take. And yes, I'm willing to spend the time. Okay, I know that. Makes I know that. To make a All right. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Adams, mm -hmm. can you, I mean, I don't know if the board is prepared right now to say when they when they could meet aren't we supposed to reserve the third <coughs> tuesday of each month mm -hmm. i would like to ask that if we do this that we have in this room or at the other building the technology so that we can pull things up mm -hmm. because you can't do it just from paper copies of maps. I know that from experience. You're going to have to have the technology in order to be able to make a responsible decision. So I don't know where logistically that would be best, Mr. Anderson, but- We'll, we'll look at that. Okay, I, uh, I'm sure that Ms. Brinson and you can so the, find some place and some method that we can be successful. So at the work session, you want to look at elementary, middle, and high school district maps and propose changes? I think we ought to. I think, I think we, we can break that up. over three, look at everything. three work sessions to address high so, school. But the, so the maps. intent of the work session is to create a redistricting plan. That's... Or, or, to look at it, not to look at it. I'm not, I'm not going to say that I'm prepared to vote, but yeah, to look at it, to discuss it, to educate myself, and to feel <clears throat> more comfortable about the process. Can we also talk about long-term stuff? I think that was pretty important yeah. so sure. that we can look 10 years out. Which, and yeah, which would help us make a decision now for what to do right. if, if we have that information. Mr. Anderson, I would say that that discussion would include a long-range view, redistricting options, what temporary housing costs would be under the different scenarios. I know you've already done all that, but I think you'd be prepared so that as this board discusses it, you, we have the ability to do cost-benefit and uh, be in a position to uh, tailor our request to the
county commissioners in the future for what we're going to do and what we're going to need to operate. Also, I think you might want to address the fact that we've got some, <clears throat> some educational cottages that are almost as old as I am. And, uh, oh you know, my God, they're old then. <laughs> I know. Uh, but that, uh, you know, can we potentially, if we do use them to alleviate overcrowding for a while, when we address, finally address the issue with brick and mortar structures, are there units that we can replace those out of date, dilapidated units with? these units that we may have acquired. So in, in a sense, it's not like we're just getting them and temporarily, they actually serve our long range purpose for some of our uh, mobile units. So sure. if you could kind of look at what's the oldest ones, how many <coughs> of them are there, kind of like the replacement of computers replacing these units. Mr. Higgins, is that, do you think we should talk about I mean, we're talking about spending money, obviously. Right. Do you think maybe at some point also start developing a plan for the next bond cycle? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. So incorporate that in. Yeah. yeah. What you're talks, I mean, obviously it's going to be money we're going to need from, from somewhere, but sure. incorporating the bond mm -hmm. discussions in that as well. Yeah. And I mean, and, and if we, you know, if we determine that we can survive without having to build a middle school, but maybe building an addition to a school, that's then, it. I mean, you know, those, all those things we need to talk about because one of the criticisms we got was, or at least I saw, was that the board was not looking out into the future. They were just simply addressing the issue right now and not looking, you know, where are we going to be in 10 years, where are we going to be in, you know, 20 years. Yeah. Also, with the maps, Mr. Anderson, the, the most massive in all this will certainly be the elementary because when you send Blair students back to Blair and you've got an empty school there, that will probably impact every elementary school in, in the system. But also we would need information as to uh, where we are with River Lights, as to what they are going to, uh, I know we've talked about so much acreage and so forth, and we've also talked about expanding Mary C. Williams, but then uh, there might be some other possibilities, like a K-8, something like that, due to the situation at Murray. That, we that talked in, in that Friday meeting, we talked a lot about yeah. southern part of the county, too, yeah. identifying properties if we were going to do a middle school, it, 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 where, to, where to put those. The only other thing down there I'm aware of is Battle Park, and I don't know what's happening there. I'd like to be prepared to discuss things, even such as like a ninth grade center for Laney at Trask, things that we have talked about to look at the viability mm -hmm. and whether or not we're just wishful thinking or, or things like that could actually be done. Okay. Well, the 17th, Mrs. Adams said, is our second Tuesday or third Tuesday? But, I mean, well, y'all? How about a Monday, the 16th? Day before the end of tax season. Pardon? I said that's the day before the last day of tax season. Can't do it. Oh. We'll see. I could do the 23rd. 23rd? Going I once? Could she I don't have my calendar. I wasn't expecting I'm not coming, to. Well, whatever. I'm not coming back till the 24th. I'm going out to see my daughter in Colorado Springs and my grandson. You're given permission to do that. Um, so I could do the 25th. Wednesday the 25th. 25th. I can do it. 25th. I Could you send the dates and let us let you know tomorrow? Because I don't have my calendar. That, uh, but that's just my opinion. And speaking of, of calendars, please respond to Mrs. Adams about the hearings because this mother has asked quite a while ago for a hearing, and, uh, and we're not getting a total response of seven board members. I responded immediately. I did too. I did too. So do we have four now? Okay. I couldn't make it. No. <laughs> yeah, she responded, but she couldn't make it. Yeah. Well, That's she not, asked I know, us yes, to respond, I'm and not, I responded. I yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you did. You did. You, we, we need four yeses. I think we need to take a break, too. 
Uh, I think we got four items that we'll be able to get rid of very quickly. So, all right, so we're going to, Ms. Adams is going to send out a request for when, uh, you know, we can meet for a work session and uh, hopefully maybe send out some dates and instead of just letting us respond, send out, I guess you would, you'd send out some dates. And, uh, I mean, the world will, will survive without me, but I would like to be here. Yeah, I think you need, uh, we need full board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, well then let's move on then to new business. 2018-2019 uh, proposed county budget request. Ms. Small, five, you, you want to take five? I mean, how, how long is this going to take? It's about <laughs> always responding. I thought we were going to be done by seven, <laughs> folks, so. <laughs> so we're going to take about a five-minute break. Thank you. It's been two and a half hours. I think we're due a